All right, happy Monday, everybody. Today we are going to talk about sediments, specifically about how we make them. So um, we'll do that in a bit, but before we jump into the lecture, this video should be a little bit shorter than normal. Um, just some logistics, okay? This week we're gonna be talking about sediments and sedimentary rocks. And a reminder is what is due this coming Sunday at 11.59 p.m. And again, I know you guys are adjusting to this new schedule and that's okay, I am too. But um, in your own interest, don't wait until Sunday night to do all of this work, okay? It's totally manageable if you spread it out throughout the week, you know, just do a little bit every day and you'll be okay. But if you wait until, you know, 9 p.m. on Sunday and then email me frantically about it, um, that's, you know, that's problematic. So please do these assignments earlier in the week. Um, it should be a, should be relatively easy this week, okay? So uh, you have due the lecture quizzes from each lecture this week, right? Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And these are separate and different from the reading quizzes, which for this coming week is interlude B, which is surface veneer, sediments and soil, and chapter six, Pages of Earth's Past Sedimentary Rocks. Then you will also need to do Lab 8, which is about sand. And you'll read a really good um, article that was in the New Yorker a few years ago that is about sand as a natural resource. And you will answer questions based on that reading um, and write a short argument whether you think the earth is, or the world is running out of sand. And then the second part of the lab builds upon what you read about in the article and you will examine um, satellite image time lapses um, using this thing called Google Earth Engine. It's not Google Earth, it's something separate and you just follow the links that I've posted in the doc into the assignment document to open it up in your browser. And you'll answer questions about your observations of those um, time lapses. And I'll do a little demo at the end today just to show you how that works. Okay. And then I mentioned this last week, but I've pushed off the exam that was supposed to be this previous Friday um, originally, um, and I am pushing it back um, until next Wednesday. And the way this will work is that I will post um, this test on Blackboard and I will make it available on Wednesday. And you can take it at any time until Friday. So, um, you know, I will make this an open note, open book um, test. So use your notes from lectures, use the actual textbook, use my slides, um, and that will help you do the exam. You will be given one hour to complete the whole thing in one sitting. You can't, um, you cannot, stop and then go and do all your work for uh, do some more studying based on what you saw in the exam and come back you have one hour once it starts and then it'll stop after an hour and then if you have special testing accommodations um, through the university i will still maintain those based on um, this hour-long exam the way this will be formatted is it'll be pretty similar to my last exam multiple choice fill in the blank matching questions, um, and I will work on posting a study guide. And here are the like main, you know, the main topic areas that will be included on the exam. The geologic time, plate tectonics, the rock cycle, magma and igneous rocks, volcanoes, and weathering, okay? So um, I know that you all are probably a little bit alarmed about like, you know, how's this test going to go, especially if I didn't do well on the first exam. Um, I recognize that the situation is different now and it is a little bit more difficult um, than it would have normally been. So um, with that in mind, um, hopefully having open note, open book will help you along in this exam and it'll be okay. All right. All right, so let's go into the exam or into the lecture now. So, what is sediment? Okay, sediment is what is produced through 
surface weathering, reactions and processes that happen at the surface of the Earth. And we can define sediment as fragments of rocks and minerals that have been busted up and transported across the landscape, right? You guys have all seen this if you've gone hiking, right? You go up to the very top of the mountain and you see boulders on the trail on the on the way uh, up up to the top. You are seeing how fragments of rock from that mountain have broken off, right? And now they are sediments that are on the landscape. And over time, they will get broken up further and further until they're busted up into fine clays that make it all the way out into the deep ocean, right? So weathering is this essential link between the rocks, bedrock, right? Any type of rock, you can, you can weather an igneous rock, a sedimentary rock, or a metamorphic rock, and how you transform it into a mobile material on Earth's surface. So sediment can be also composed of chemical precipitates from water, right? So if you um, have water that is uh, become super saturated in something like salt or calcium carbonate, then you can begin to precipitate out uh, a new chemical. So the way that we get salt, right, to put on, you know, put on the table for dinner is that lakes and ocean basins dry up and then those rocks are exposed at their surface and chemical precipitates um, is what we ultimately mine for salt. And then sediment can also consist of, um, at, you know, at the beach of shells and shell fragments, right? So you guys have probably been so somewhere on the beach where you walk around and you notice that it's just like all um, clam and oyster and mussel shells, just like that hash. Eventually, you know, that turns into a layer of sediment on um, a coastal area and it can become a sedimentary rock. And so the essential thing that we'll talk mostly about today with sediment is how does sediment form? And it forms through weathering. And we have two main types of weathering, physical and chemical weathering. So weathering is um, the combined effect of both mechanical breakdown and chemical reactions of bedrock into something else at Earth's surface. And what we can typically think of with weathering is that rocks break down along pre-existing weaknesses. Some minerals or types of rock will chemically react more readily at Earth's surface than others. And then how quickly weathering rates, both physical and chemical um, reactions occur based on the size of the grain, the size of the, the fragment of rock. So this is a, a good image of a weathering um, outcrop of bedrock from Madagascar. And it shows how the um, laser pointer, right? So we can see here that this is the solid bedrock, right? And then there are pre-existing weaknesses, joints, which are just sort of the, the cracks in the rock as it has turned from turned into a solid rock. And then we also see that there's rusty red colors that are showing up in between the larger fragments of rock along these pre-existing weaknesses. And that's the effect of physical weathering combined with chemical weathering to produce this rusty looking um, chemical product, okay? So um, this is kind of what we're thinking about with weathering and how things turn from solid rock um, into a mobile um, sediment um, on the landscape, okay? So let's first talk about physical weathering. So physical weathering is the mechanical breakdown intact rock fragments into smaller fragments. What we um, use as a term for this is producing a clast. So a clast is just a fragment of a rock, of a larger rock. So this is a good example from the dry valleys of Antarctica, where you can see that these three clasts used to be part of one single rock. In physical weathering, the actual cracking and breaking of them apart has created three clasts, okay? And these clasts from this initial rock fell off of a cliff composed of dolerite, 
in Antarctica where the pre-existing weaknesses, which you can see here, these columnar joints, these vertical cracks in the bedrock, allow it to be weak and then they fall off the side. Okay, So the causes of physical weathering right, are pre-existing weaknesses. Okay? It's easy you know, to break something that's already broken, basically. And then there's uh, several others that I'll go over in detail now, okay? So pre-existing weaknesses, right? So these are things like joints, bedding planes, and faults. So a joint is just the sort of structure of exposed bedrock. So we looked at Devil's Tower in uh, Wyoming in the last lecture about igneous intrusions, and it's composed of um, this columnar jointed uh, basalt. And it breaks off of that cliff face and falls down onto this scree field below. So you could also have a situation where you have the perfect layering of sedimentary rocks, and that could be a zone of pre-existing weakness for physical weathering. And if you also have faulted rocks where rocks have slid past each other, that creates a zone of weakness for phys further physical weathering. The next type of physical weathering we can have is frost wedging. And this is when you have void spaces in rocks that have begun as an initially a very small crack. And then you have water that uh, percolates and fills the crack. And then the weather gets colder and it freezes. And we know that um, water expands when it turns into a solid ice. And so that expansion expands the cavity. So now that cavity is being propped open. But then as the ice thaws and back into liquid water, now you have this void space that can collapse back down on itself. So sort of the most um, like extraordinary examples of these are up on high alpine areas in places uh, where the ground surface is just covered by frost shattered uh, rocks. And if you go up and go hiking up to the top of Mount Washington or drive up there, you'll see that there's all these blocky rock fields all over the surface, and we call this felsenmere. So that's what we can see in nature, but frost wedging is a physical weathering process that also happens in uh, the human environment, where expansion of ice in the subsurface beneath roads um, causes cropping open of fractures, and then when it melts and cars come back over and run over it, it collapses those cracks and you create potholes. Okay. So that's why at the bottom of Pearl Street, um, you know, there's always terrible, terrible potholes at that intersection on Willard, right? So then another type of physical weathering is salt wedging, where if you have the precipitation of salt crystals from like um, a coastal wind where there's a lot of salt in the air, and that salt gets into cracks in between the rock, and then um, uh, it will disintegrate the rock, as it props open those fractures and then eventually like um, is dissolved away by other water. So it leaves behind these cool honeycomb textures in coastal areas that you guys have seen probably in some rocky coast areas. And it can also occur in deserts too. So another example of physical weathering is root wedging, right? So this is just from biological act, action from trees. Right. You guys have seen this probably like if you've gone hiking in the Green Mountains or any really mountainous area and you see those trees which have somehow figured out how to set their roots on barren bedrock off the side of a cliff. So those roots are intruding into that void space in the rocks and it's causing expansion and it cracks them open until eventually those cliff faces or rock cracks will break away. This is the same process you see um, in an urban environment where if you put sidewalks um, over areas with really big trees, you know, the, the growth of the roots causes buckling in the sidewalk. Then humans in general, we are an incredible um, physical weathering agent because we are, have become very good at um, changing the landscape completely. And there's no better example of this than a mine where we have figured out how to completely dig away huge volumes of rock and break them up into smaller pieces. And we also do this whenever we pave a road or grade road, making housing developments. Basically, everything that humans do when we build stuff causes physical weathering of the environment. And then I wanted to wait to 
to show you guys thermal expansion. And thermal expansion is um, an interesting form of physical weathering where the rapid heating and cooling of rocks can cause instant fractures. Okay, so these instant fractures are caused when we have rock that um, has formed initially under like a lot of confining pressure, right? So we can see like, oh, here's like millions of years ago, there's a little dinosaur going around and then there's this rock which has stayed in place and there's stuff holding it in place. But then as that rock or sediment that was overlying it is removed, now there's nothing holding onto it. So what happens during thermal weathering is you can have a rapid change in temperature just from like a really hot summer day and then um, going into shade or into a cold, uh, cold night and it causes um, rocks to contract quickly and that can cause shattering. So there's this uh, one place uh, in the Sierra Nevada where you can actually see this happen in real life where um, these um, rocks kind of shatter from changes in daily temperature. So let's Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do now is just go to this um, YouTube so that you can see it. Let's watch that one more time because it's pretty rapid. Okay, so that is a process that um, can sculpt a lot of different landscapes, but especially in granitic landscapes where you have that type of weathering that's possible. So you can end up with thermal weathering producing these huge slabs of rock that just snap off in layers. And you, this is often very common in um, granitic environments, but also desert environments, where you can have really intense days, really where the rock surfaces heat up to be really hot, and then um, very cold nights. And um, so that's an important weathering process, okay? Okay, so now what is the net effect of physical weathering, right? So as you break up um, a larger rock into smaller rocks, you get different grain sizes. And grain size is really just the diameter of a fragment of rock, right? And the way that geologists refer to this is that something with fine grain size means it's relatively small, and something with coarse grain size means it's pretty big. And these are absolutely essential for classifying what type of sediment you have, as well as sedimentary rocks. And so the way that we break this down is that we have um, boulders, which are our largest grain diameter, anything more than 256 millimeters, right? Anything more than 25 centimeters. So um, that's like almost about greater than a foot, okay? And then cobbles, which are smaller, pebbles, right? That's kind of like stuff that you might find in a small brook in um, like in a mountain stream. And then sand, which is between one sixteenth of a millimeter and two millimeters, followed by silt, which is um, less than sixteenth of a millimeter, but greater than one two hundred six millimeters. And that's the sort of stuff that if you find silt, you can rub between your fingers and still feel a little grit, right? And then finally, the smallest grain size is clay. Clay is the has the smallest diameters, and that's when, like, if you've been in a pottery class or an art class, when you use clay to throw a pot or make a sculpture, right, you can feel it smooth out and you can roll it into, um, into different shapes. Okay. So what I wanted to do um, to show you guys the effects of um, physical weathering on chemical weathering is I did a little experiment this morning and I'll, let, I'll just uh, show it now, okay. All right, everyone, I'm going to show you guys the effect of grain size on chemical reaction rates. So I have found some 
expired NIN tablets that would have kept me nice and hydrated in the past, but I think these are expired. I'm still going to drink these, whatever. So they come in two tablets, right? Okay, so we'll do our control experiment, right? So we have just the normal tablet, right? This is a larger grain size. So now, let's see what happens if we change the grain size. So I'm going to smash this with this chicken hammer or whatever. Ooh, that thing's pretty hard. Okay. I have done physical weathering, okay? So now we're going to see what happens to the reaction rate of the nun tablet. What's going to go into solution first based on the grain size, all right? So I'll put in the big tablet first, right? All right, so now what I'll show you guys is a time-lapse video of what happens when we introduce both the fully intact tablet and the physically weathered crushed tablet. Okay, so this is a time-lapse and it shows on the left the intact tablet and on the right the crushed tablet, right? And you can see that the crushed tablet is going into solution much, 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 much more quickly than that solid top tablet. Let's watch that again. Okay. So almost instantly, the crushed tablet goes into solution. So clearly, there is a relationship between chemical reaction rate and grain size. Okay. And I told you that I would drink it. Okay. All right, so what does this mean? So grain sizes is related to the change in the surface area exposed on individual grains, all right? So you can think of this as increasing the amount of rock face available for chemical attack, right? So if we start out with just one meter cube, right? You are gonna have that large rock face. But as you break it up exponentially, right, you break this up into uh, four pieces on each side, right, you're going to have more faces for, that are available for chemical reactions, right, on all sides of these new cubes we form. And you keep doing that, and you keep doing that, and eventually you end up with much, much exponentially greater um, amount of surface area on these grains that are exposed. So just like with the... Um, Nun tablet experiment, right? You are seeing this difference, right? As I crush up that uh, little tablet, right, and make those new surface areas, there is more availability for it to dissolve more readily into the water. Right? So the other side of weathering is chemical weathering. And these are chemical reactions that alter the initial rock and mineral chemistry through environmental processes. Whenever we have chemical weathering, we have um, the production of secondary weathering products. And we can have several different types of chemical weathering, right? We can have dissolution, which is when you put water plus some minerals, and then you end up dissolving the minerals into that water and you have ions in solution. So the best example of this in nature is limestone, which is calcium carbonate plus water, you end up eroding out limestone into caves plus water that is rich in calcium and carbonate ions. Okay. Another type of chemical weathering is hydrolysis, and this is where water is reactive with minerals. And what this typically generates is um, the reaction of silicates, so like a silicate mineral like a feldspar plus water, will lead to the, um, the creation of clays and other ions in the environment, okay? So in this lower image here, this actually shows what goes on in a little piece of granite, which is made of quartz, biotite, and feldspar. And if you add water to this, you end up uh, weathering more quickly the feldspar and the biotite, but the quartz doesn't weather as quickly. And so you're left behind with just quartz, and then um, the remaining minerals end up um, dissolving away and create clays, okay? 
And then another type of chemical weathering is oxidation. And this is simply um, a process where you have iron bearing minerals and you expose them to oxygen and you end up creating rust. Okay, so rust is a chemical weathering product. Right? So you can see this um, even um, like if you're walking around, like uh, I was just at Letty Beach the other day and I saw that there was um, a bunch of um, sediment that had turned from sort of just a tan color to a bright red orange color and it's through oxidation um, of that sediment. And then finally, you can have a hydration reaction where if you have minerals and you add water, you can you sort of push the um, water molecule into the molecular structure of that mineral and it causes a physical change. And this is common in clays, which can swell and become much more expansive if you add water. Okay. So the other really important aspect of weathering is that this is what leads to the development of soil. And while we will not really cover very much about soil in this class, we should still know what it is, right? So soil is rock and sediment that is both physically and chemically altered through complex biologic and physical interactions. So things that are living um, on Earth's surface, microbes, animals, vegetation, they cause chemical reactions that are aided by the percolation of surface water into the ground. And this causes chemical alteration and stratification of soil horizons. So if we have here um, a tree with its roots down in the ground and then rainwater that falls down, right? You have worms that are digging around and churning up the soil and they create debris. Basically, they're pooping in the soil and they create little debris. You have reactions going on around the roots, right? As well as other reactions going on between microbes and fungus that are living in the soil. And then this causes um, the creation of uh, different ions, which will then leach, right? They travel down through the soil with percolating groundwater and they accumulate lower below it in the soil horizon. So this process of leaching and accumulation and all these complex uh, environmental and biological interactions can produce stratified soil sequences. Right? And soil science is a huge field unto itself. I am not a soil scientist, but um, you could go on into that field. And a big thing in soil science is classifying the different types of soils based on their um, physical characteristics and the types of environments that they form. In. And so this uh, aspect of earth science is really important for humans because this determines basically everything about where we can grow food, the type of food that we can grow, um, where it's safe to build um, certain types of um, structures or um, the stability of different soils for um, like if they're going to erode quickly. It can also be a public health um, concern if you erode soil very quickly, you no longer have something to grow food in, but you can also cause dust storms. So while this isn't a big um, part of this class, soils are important um, to understand at the social level. And then I'll finish today by um, sort of integrating all of this stuff together, all right? And that surface processes are basically just physical and chemical weathering processes that produce sediment and soil on the landscape. And so we can look across any type of landscape. So this is just like an imaginary one where we can start in um, colder environments where glaciers are causing a lot of physical weathering and um, grinding up rocks into smaller bits. And then the water that is generated by glaciers that melts off can cause chemical reactions and chemical weathering with that newly um, freshly produced sediment. Then Sediments get transported across landscapes by rivers, right? And then those rivers transport sediments far out to the ocean. But that's not the only thing that's going on in the environment, right? You have bedrock that's exposed at the surface and it weathers. You have other rocks that are eroding away and creating large blocks of sediment that might fall near a riverbed and then get picked up by the river. 
you have chemical reactions going on in different types of rocks. So like limestone is dissolving because it's made of calcium carbonate with water, and that can create caverns that you could go explore. And then you also have soil formation that's going on in all of these places, right? Because life is incredibly good at adapting to whatever environment or um, conditions are present, and that ultimately leads to the formation of different soils, right? And then we also have, um, you know, processes going out near the ocean, right? Sediments make it out into the ocean when they're deposited, but we also have waves and storms that will erode out coastlines, producing more sediment. So in the next class, we will talk about, you know, how these different environments, right? These are all sedimentary processes, weathering processes, how they are um, captured in the geologic record as rocks. And then I just want to um, go over lab eight just so that you guys know what to do. So in Blackboard, I have posted the assignment as well as a PDF of a article from the New Yorker that is, I think, pretty good. So it's about sand as a natural resource and whether or not humans are exhausting it. You'll answer um, some short questions about it that get you to think about um, what was presented in that article. And then um, you will examine, not X main, um, some Google Earth time lapses related to the article. So this is kind of a cool um, website where you can watch um, a time lapse, so a sequence of images from the same spot on Earth's surface through time and um, see any changes. And I'll show you what this looks like in a second, but um, this engine uses quite a bit of memory and bandwidth. So um, as you're doing this, you should probably close all of your other tabs or other browser windows, as well as any like programs that are eating up a lot of memory. Um, and then you can do things like change the speed of the time lapse um, as well as pause it. And let me show you what this looks like. So I will just bring up. So this is the assignment. It is definitely shorter than what you guys did last time. So um, let's start out. I'll just show you this one. Okay. So it, you'll just click on the links that I have in the assignment, and then it'll take you to a um, a like preset coordinate place. So you don't need to change where you are unless I tell you to. And then at the bottom here, you'll see all the years of imagery it has as well as the playback speed. So you can slow it down or go, or go at 1x and then play. So let's just watch what happens um, on this landscape here. Right, so we are seeing this sequence of satellite images and we can see changes on the ground. So this is what you'll do. You'll just be going here and seeing, um, seeing how the surface of the Earth changes and specifically think about sands. Um, I will have office hours um, today as well as Wednesday and Friday if you have any questions. Okay, thanks.